Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I'm a co-host along with Drew Johnson and Matt Bates, Aaron Heim, Amy Brown Hughes, and sometimes even Chris Tilling. Thanks so much for listening. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ed Hatke for faithfully producing each episode of OnScript. Uh, you don't know this, but but there are times where um, the deadline for, for getting the episode ready is quickly approaching, and Ed sends me a gentle email saying, Matt, do you have any files for me? And then I send them, and he produces the show with very little lead time um, on many occasions. So thank you so much, Ed, for all the work that you put into this. And thanks also to Rebecca Terhune, who has uh, really taken our social media and newsletter to the next level, and she's been really helpful with that. Uh, Thanks also to Tommy Molman for his help with um, marketing as well. So uh, we really appreciate all those who were involved in helping uh, deliver and and promote uh, on script. Uh, this episode's a bit different. We don't normally broadcast our own talks that we do at different places. Um, all of us in various ways are involved in uh, public speaking uh, events. Uh, but I heard this one from Drew Johnson, uh, who's a co-host here, if you're new, and asked him if we could use it. He and then uh, Christ Church in Jerusalem, where he recorded this, kindly agreed to it. So this comes out of Drew's recent book uh, called Human Rights, The Power of Rituals, Habits, and Sacraments, and uh, we hope that you enjoy it. Let us know what you think by giving us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get this. Thanks. This recording has been produced by Christ Church Jerusalem. For more information, visit us at cmj-israel.org. Thank you all for coming. I think you'll be. Uh, I think all of us will be rewarded by hearing uh, Drew speak. Of course, as always, there'll be time for questions, and uh, I'll ask him to repeat the question so it uh, uh, can be heard uh, on the podcast. And I'm going to let Drew introduce himself, but uh, let's pray. So, Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to hear Drew. Uh, Thank you for the way that you've used him to challenge and to encourage your people. We pray that it will be no different tonight. We ask that uh, you would indeed teach us and that you would use your servant, Drew Johnson, Lord, to instruct us and bring us into a place of deeper maturity in the Messiah. And we pray this for his sake, the sake of Jesus. Amen. Okay, Drew. It's... Good evening. Uh, in my church, we'd say boa noite, which is uh, Portuguese. i got to pull out my notes here. I don't know how to introduce myself. I'm Drew. <laughs> I'm a, uh, I used to be a pastor. I'm still ordained, uh, but I used to be a full-time pastor. Ten years ago, I guess I was a full-time pastor, and then I felt the call of God to go back into higher education, got my PhD uh, at St. Andrews in Scotland, um, and then um, took a job as a professor, and I've been a a professor of biblical studies and theology for the last uh, nine years. Um, I have four kids. All four are teenagers. So, yes, (laughs) the look on your face is exactly right. They're wonderful children, but they're teenagers, which is a rough time, so there's a lot of... um, coaching going on right now, uh, but they're wonderful. I love, uh, I love them, and I'm very grateful for them. And I've um, maintained a single marriage over the last 21 years, so that's been good, yes. Her, her uh, commitment to the idea of marriage has been very good. Um, okay, so uh, I wrote this book. I feel obligated. The publisher would want me to show it to you. So uh, Human Rights, the Power of Ritual Habits and Sacraments, and if you don't get it, rights is a play on words here, human rights, uh, so human rituals. Um, and actually, uh, it's based on a uh, scholarly book that I wrote right over there in the German colony about six years ago. So I, I, 
I write books for nerds, and then uh, this is a book where the publisher said, hey, would you ever want to talk to non-nerds about the things that you uh, have studied? And I said, no. Um, and then they said, no, this might be good for people to think about this issue of rituals and traditions and habits and sacraments and um, how do these play into the life of the church and, and even beyond the church. So they challenged me to write a book that even if you're not a Christian or a Jew or religious, um, that it would make sense to you. So that's what this book is. It's a common sense argument about why thinking about rituals and traditions is important. And then uh, for the church, I have some uh, extra bits in the back. So maybe we could start. Uh, I'm a, um, what would you call it? Uh, an involved teacher. So uh, I don't like the idea of me talking and you just listening, even though that is one ritual, right? That you just sit here and listen and I talk and you know how to sit up in your chair and, and do all the head nodding. Uh, I, I like to ask real questions, not rhetorical ones, uh, and demand real answers. So maybe we could begin by thinking about what are some of the, don't even, you don't even need to think about religion at this point, but let's just think about what are some, what people would consider traditions or rituals that they perform maybe daily or weekly or maybe even annually in their lives? That's a real question to you. Prayer. Oh, prayer, okay. Which prayer, um, in English, because of God bless him, King James, uh, we use this word prayer, right? But prayer, pray is not a religious word in English, right? Uh, pray became a religion, a religious word when the King James English writers chose to uh, translate proskuneo and uh, and Greek into this word pray. But what does pray mean? Just to be clear, what does it actually mean in original English? Yeah, to, to petition somebody who has the power to do something. You ask them, right? That's what the word pray means. But now it's picked up this, we say prayer, and it has this very particular religious meaning now. I say that only to make the point that the biblical authors don't write in religious language. They write in the common language of their day, and they're trying to describe what's going on in their lives. So Paul, you've heard of Paul, he writes all of these letters to the church. He uses legal metaphors, he uses agrarian metaphors, he uses athletic language of races and boxing and all these other things because he's just trying to pull whatever he can to describe to you what he thinks is important about what has happened in Judea, right? Okay, so prayer is a big one. Oh, uh, Edan, right? Can you um, physically show us what prayer looks like? (laughs) No, you don't want to? Okay, show me, uh, I can play this game. Tell, if we went out on the street and asked somebody, what would they show us? (laughs) This is good. Okay, so she's got her hands together, like swimming. So probably down here, yeah. So who, is anybody from a tradition where you bow your head when you pray? Anybody do that? Okay. Anybody from a tradition where you lift your head up when you pray? So this is some traditions, they only lift their heads up. Or, or Davin, yeah, right? Or uh, some people s- only sit down when they pray. So when they say, let's pray, everybody sits. Uh, some people, when they say, let's pray, everybody has to stand up, right? So the, but there's a physical posture to prayer. In my tradition, I became a Christian at 20 and, and came into the evangelical charismatic church. And for them, they think of prayer as a spiritual activity that's just words between you and God. And I just want to point out what's obvious is it's never just words, Right? It's, there's the whole body is involved in the action. Uh, I used to joke, at, I went to a seminary with a lot of people from the South in America, not a South America, but the, from Southern culture. And I would joke, if, if you wanted to figure out who was from the South in the room, you just say, let's pray, and then all the baseball hats would come off. Because in their culture, you do not wear a hat when you pray, right? But obviously, um, you know, Jewish culture, you have to wear a hat when you pray, right? Okay. So prayer, that's one. We're not going to talk that much about each individual. So anybody have a non-religious ritual or a a tradition that people do? So yeah, certain, exactly, certain foods for holidays. Anybody, uh, anybody ever think of this? uh, In America, we do this pagan ritual, or it's a neo-pagan ritual. Every year around the end of December, you guys know the month of December, where I'm from, uh, people do all of these weird gift-giving ceremonies, and they take perfectly good living trees, they kill them, they drag them into their house, they dress them up and watch them die slowly in the corner. Have you, anybody ever heard of this one? Yeah. At least in the UK, um, they have winter festivals, so they kind of separate out Advent from the pagan festival, but uh, yeah, we do it with our kids, too, because we want them to be good pagans, so. What else? Uh, so, serving certain foods at holidays? 
What else? Brushing your teeth, right? Why do, why do we brush our teeth? Just to state the obvious. Keep them clean, yes. Who here actually has read the research on how well brushing your teeth actually keeps, like did anybody ever stop and think it might be a massive government conspiracy? <laughs> That it actually does nothing whatsoever, but for some reason, you know, maybe they have microphones in there and they want to, I mean, okay, so that's, that's kind of absurd. But in America, and I'm sorry I have to refer to America, but it's the culture I'm most familiar with. Um, in America, there was a massive conspiracy to get people to drink milk. Uh, and so they had the National Dairy Council who began selling a line that said, milk makes your teeth strong, your bones strong, your muscles strong. And after a few thousand scientific studies, uh, it turns out that none of that's true. That there, there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that in, in, in taking calcium makes your bones strong. It turns out that jogging, walking, weightlifting, anything with gravity is actually what does it. But for years, decades even, I grew up, got milk, drink milk, drink more milk, 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 milk. Um, Yeah, you do have to have a regular amount of calcium, but it turns out that you can get all of this calcium through like all like fruits and vegetables and all, yeah, <laughs> through chocolate. Now we're talking, yeah. Notice that all of these, we can call them rituals, we can call them traditions, we, we, can, we can call them whatever we want. Um, liturgies, some people have gotten in the habit of calling these secular liturgies uh, versus church liturgies. But uh, whatever we want to call them, it's always somebody trying to get you to do something specific with your body and not just to mess with you. Like, I don't believe that the National Dairy Council just wanted to play a big prank on America. So like, for three decades, let's just pump millions of dollars into advertising to get people to drink milk. That'd be hilarious, right? No, but they want you to drink milk because it supports an entire economic system of dairy farming. And, and, and we have this whole, like, wholesome idea of dairy farming in America. It's really perverted. But uh, I'm not anti-milk, by the way. It's just uh, I just want to be very real about our milk consumption. But it's, it's somebody, you know, I call it the ritual war. And you're, you're all in this war. Somebody is trying to get you to do something with your body for some reason. Right? And so you have to think about each one of those aspects when we talk about traditions and rituals. Who is the person or group of people or tradition? What do they want you to do and why? Right? And you have to have all of those three things in, in tension uh, to explore what goes on with rituals. So I have, there's a, um, there's a really easy answer to this. Uh, if you want to think about, I, I teach mostly 18 to 24 year olds, so young people. Um, and so I'm all up on all the hip, the new language. I, I, I'm in New York City. That's where I teach, right? So I'm in the center of both uh, Haredi Judaism <laughs> and hipster land, right? So it's the worst of everything that you've heard about hipsters is true. They're horrible. But I also get all the, the latest in technology. And so it's often the case that, because um, I was going to ask you to, here, I'll, I'll try to do it up here. I'm going to show you what I, I'll walk in early in the morning into my office and I'll see a student in the corner going like this. And I'll think, oh, how wonderful. They're like sitting here 8 a.m. in the morning, praying before class, and then they turn around and they go, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I've been fooled by this more than a dozen times. I'm always, oh, no, it's just the phone. In fact, it turns out they're never praying. But they are praying, right? They've adopted a certain posture. I, I, I have a chiropractor friend who says that it's, it's now, uh, you know, chiropractors are the people who work on neck and back. It is now an official diagnosis, smartphone. Uh, there's a smartphone diagnosis because people tend to do this. It's a very, I slouch for really old fashioned reasons. You know, uh, as a child of the 70s and I'm tall, that's why I slouch. But these kids, uh, they slouch like this. We can blame kids, but 40 year olds are just as bad as 18 year olds these days. Just notice that there's, uh, there's a whole group, there's uh, a group of people who wants you to hold this in your hand. They want you to put it in your body. They want you to turn on buzzes and dings and notifications. And, and as soon as this is against your body and it's dinging or buzzing, it gets mapped into your neural network, right? And so much so that I don't, I turn all that junk off, but my students tell me, I read about this, I almost could not believe it. Anybody ever heard of phantom text syndrome? So if you turn the buzzer on where it vibrates and you take this out over here, eventually you will feel a buzz in your leg and you will swear the phone was in your pocket, but the phone's actually sitting over there. It's because your neurology has mapped the thing in. 
and it's expecting the buzz, and so it fires off your, your neurons over here because it wants it. Because uh, people who do these things, they know it's not just any old buzz, right? I want you to interact with this thing with your body for this particular reason. So when I get a buzz, it means somebody wants to talk to me, something important is coming in. I get a micro hit of adrenaline, which makes me feel good about it. It doesn't even matter if it's junk mail or if it's somebody I don't want to talk to. It's the prospect of wanting to talk to somebody. I, I have to imagine it's pretty similar. I'm new, I just got this last year. It's my first uh, smartphone. But uh, I have to imagine when I was growing up, you had a, a phone on the wall in the middle of the house, and it was the only phone. Uh, but when the phone rang, it was so exciting. Like, somebody from the outside world wants to talk to somebody in here, right? Uh, and it was never for me, but I would run and answer it every time. Uh, and now the irony is uh, I have to tell my students that there's an actual feature on this thing where you can talk with your voice to somebody else because they don't use that feature at all. They, uh, they, in fact, many of them refuse to uh, use their voice. In fact, in New York City, Poison Control had to set up a website that was phone friendly because young people were too nervous uh, to talk to somebody on the phone uh, voice to voice. So they had to set up uh, a, a text interaction with Poison Control because it turns out when you call 911 or emergency hotlines, you get a voice and they, it was made them too nervous, right? Now, just think about that for a second. That reaction that you have to set up a text hotline instead of a voice hotline is because there's a whole generation of people who have been habituated and ritualized into a certain kind of interaction with other people. And the idea of standing face to face with Adan, it makes them very nervous. And I see this definitely in the classroom uh, as well. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's actually very sad uh, to see their, their levels of anxiety and depression are sky high right now. Somebody wanted to get them to do something repeatedly, daily, even you know, hundreds of times a day uh, for a particular outcome. In that case, the outcome is what? Why, why would somebody take a very inhumane tool? Like, if you just buy this off the shelf, put applications on there, let the dingers and buzz just go, there is nothing humane about that whatsoever. Right? Your body is not designed for that. Your, your uh, brain, your attention span is not designed to be interrupted constantly. Uh, my eyes are not designed for my, you know, me watching me try to type out a text is very painful because I can only do one letter at a time and I miss them because I have fat fingers. And, um, but why would somebody do that? Why would somebody commit billions and billions of dollars to getting a generation of people to do that? to make trillions of dollars, right? And it comes down to time on screen. The longer you can keep people on the screen, uh, the better. So uh, if you want to think about traditions or habits or rituals, I, I like the term ritual because I know it has a, a lot of people think of it negatively, but it actually gathers a lot of this stuff together. Um, so what could we say is similar between brushing teeth, praying, and having the same meal every year for Christmas, the same pudding, you know, at the end of Christmas or something? Uh, what, what ties all those things together? Um, there's a good definition that I've heard that I'm, I'm passing along, uh, which is a ritual, it's basically this. It's some normal human activity that's been strategically twisted or changed in some way uh, for a new end, right, for a new goal. So a normal activity is to, you know, this started out a long time ago as talking, wanting to talk to people on the phone, right? And it's been strategically changed and twisted and twisted and twisted until I can get this. Because phone companies did not make a ton of money by getting me to talk on this thing, right? They made a lot of money when they found out they could get me to download apps and interacting with us in a new way. Brushing teeth... Uh, it's hygiene, right? It's a, a type of cleaning, but it's towards this other thing because, um, okay, don't get offended. But I noticed, my British friends told me when I lived in Scotland, this is what they said, I'm just reporting, right? Is that you can always tell an American because they have straight white teeth, right? I have neither of those, straight nor white teeth. Um, but I started noticing this because I lived in St. Andrews, so there's a lot of Americans coming through there. And I noticed that it became clear Americans have a much higher value for this very white, very straight teeth than most of the world does. We're weird in this aspect, right? Which means we're willing to do all kinds of physical abuse to our bodies, right? So I, my kids all have all had braces, uh, not to get them straight, but to get them functional. We're not into the cosmetic side, but, um, but they've had to go through this physical pain month after month after month 
for years in order to get their teeth in a certain way, right? So now why would we contort our bodies? It's because in our culture it's become valued. So we've gone through this weird ritual of brace wearing. And, um, and now if, you get, if you've been to a store in America, you'll see there's the toothpaste aisle is as big as the dairy aisle now, right? Uh, it's like there's 20,000 different types of toothpaste and all of them will whiten your teeth. Every single one of them at this point, right? Yeah, so if we think about that and praying, right? What is praying? It's, if I say, hey, hey, Aiden, can you help me um, you know, fix my car tomorrow? I'm asking you for a favor, right? But uh, now we're taking that same normal activity that we all do on a regular basis and we're saying, okay, let's, we're gonna change it a little bit so that when we think about God, because it doesn't seem like you should just talk to God like he's any old, like he's Edon, right? Maybe in some way you should, but in some way you shouldn't. And so often you'll see in traditions, the physical posture of prayer reflects their view of, of how they think they should be interacting with God. Because you're not just asking Edon, you're not just asking your mom for a favor, you're asking God for something. And then you even change the way you talk. I don't know uh, what traditions you come from, but uh, the evangelical tradition, it's very popular um, to have ex- uh, extemporaneous prayers that you never would read a prayer. It's always from your heart. Um, but if you listen to people pray, they start talking in this weird language that I call Christianese. So they'll say, oh, thank you, Father God, for everything you've given us, Father God, and you know everything you've known me. And they start saying all these weird things that they would never say to anybody else in real life, right? Um, and so, but, and even if they're talking funny, it's fine because even the way they're talking is acknowledging that this is a special ask. This is not just any old conversation. And maybe we could think about some other rituals where it takes a normal human practice, it strategically changes it a little bit for another reason. So think of baptism. Okay, so baptism is a ritual, right? So baptizo in the Greek, I'm sure you know, is just the Greek word for wash. If in, in, in Koine Greek, back in the days of Jesus, if you said, I'm going to wash the dishes, you'd say, baptizo dishes, right? So, uh, so what's the normal human practice? A bath, right? It, it's actually not that simple, but we'll just pretend like it is for the, for the moment. So you're taking washing, you're strategically twisting it now to say, okay, now this bath is special. It's, this bath is unlike all your other baths you've ever taken or will ever take for the rest of your life. Um, and it's for this goal of understanding you've entered the kingdom of God or, or that you're going to be, if, for children, you're going to be raised in the kingdom of God. You're a member of this community. Uh, as Peter says in his epistle, you've been washed, your conscience has been washed clean by the blood of Christ. It's a bath, but it's no ordinary bath. It's been twisted, changed a little bit. And I don't mean twisted in a bad way. I just mean it's been, there's something new angle to it. But it's so that you understand something. I don't need to read it. Let me, let me think of just a few more before I move on. Uh, you guys know Sukkot? I'm in, I'm in Israel. You should know Sukkot. <laughs> uh, Leviticus 23, where it has the festivals of Israel, uh, it says with Sukkot, you shall live in, um, I never know how to translate the word Sukkot, um, in a sukkah, um, a tent, a shelter, a booth, yeah, a booth is, oh, yeah, a shack. That's a good one. Okay, I never thought about that. I'm going to start using that. I will, qu- I will footnote you on this one. So it says in Leviticus 23, 43 and following, y'all shall, sorry, I'm from Oklahoma, y'all shall live in shacks for seven days, you and your children, in order that your children might know that when I brought you out of the land of Israel, I made you to live in shacks, in Sukkot. Now, just stop and think about that for one second. If I want my children, I got four kids, right? If I wanted them to know, hey, when, when Yahweh brought us up out of Israel, we lived in shacks, what would be the easiest way for me to let them know that? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, drawings in the dirt. Yeah, show them pictures. And, and what else? So I couldn't just show them pictures. Well, unless I had like a whole comic book worth of pictures. Yeah. I can say, hey, hey, kids, I do this all the time with other things. Hey, kids, just so you know, when we came up out of Israel, or, uh, Egypt, we lived in shacks. And um, maybe you or you have kids like this, they would just go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares, right? Um, so, yeah, but notice what God requires. I mean, you, you, you've seen Sukkot practice here probably. So it's it, it's... A, a diet or a light version of Sukkot that seems to go on in lots of places. 
but it requires some effort. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Ushpazim, uh, it's a great movie about, about Sukkot. It requires some effort, especially if you're living on the edge of poverty. And you're doing all of this in order that your generations might know that I, and so as soon as you like just lay that out and think about what's being said here and what's being required of Israel, you have to say, okay, it's not just so that you know some fact called we lived in shacks when we came up out of Egypt. There's something else going on beyond that. And I can't know it unless I actually go live in that shack for seven days, once a year. And, that, and the text seems to say, and you don't get to know it unless you do that and you hear the parents talk about it. So this is all throughout the Hebrew Bible. Um, that when Joshua builds stone, a stone monuments on the side of the Jordan River, he says, and when your children ask you in the days to come, what do these stones mean to y'all? Which is interesting. They don't say, what do these stones mean? He says, what do these stones mean to you, mom and dad? Think about another one. You've probably heard of Pesach, uh, Passover. It's a big one in the Jewish calendar. Uh, but remember, what's the point of Pesach? It's give, the, the celebration is given before they ever leave Egypt, while they're still in Egypt, before um, uh, the Passover night. He says, you're going to do this with your children uh, in order that they might know, right? And it's for the sake of instructing your children. If you don't know this, in the ancient Near East, the Hebrew Bible stands alone in its central concern that the children understand what has happened. No other culture is worried about their children. Uh, they, they're worried about bringing up so they'll be good workers, so that they can take the um, family inheritance. Nobody's worried about their children understanding the history of their nation. This is a uniquely Hebraic view in the ancient world. So all of this happens. So now you might be like my students who are these soft Marcionites who think, they're like, oh, but that was in the Old Testament. The old is gone. The new has come. We don't need to worry about all that, right? And then you have Jesus who comes along. And on, on what night does he give the Lord's Supper? Passover. Right? The, the very night, and what's the purpose of Passover? Is instructing the next generation about this uh, phenomenal act of God on behalf of the nation of Israel. And what is he telling them to do? Uh, there's going to be this death tomorrow, like Passover. There's going to be this death tomorrow. Uh, and you disciples are going to be, we learn later, you're going to be the ones taking this out and telling people that this happened, right? And you're going to do this thing. So you're going to, now think about it, if we went back to ritual, What's the normal human practice that's being twisted here when it comes to the Lord's Supper? It's strategically changed. It's, it's bread and wine, I'll give you a hint. So it's bread and wine, so what's the normal practice? Eating yeah, <laughs> eating, eating dinner, thank you, Micah. Yeah, it's just a din- it's part of a meal. And he takes that part of, of course, he takes a part of a meal that's already a ritual, so I'm leaving out that whole, he's, he's re-ritualizing a ritual. But he's taking a meal, and he's strategically changing it so that his disciples and the church to come will remember him. And at this point, just like Sukkot, we'd say, okay, he clearly doesn't just want people to like have a thought like, oh yeah, Jesus, he did that thing. That it's actually trying to transform the way they see themselves, the way they see the relationship to God, to others, to history, to creation, to everything. So then the question becomes, This is what I wrote that big nerdy book on. I just went through the whole Bible and said, okay, how do they look at ritual? Hebrew Bible, obviously, ritual's in the center of everything. Um, And and then you get to the New Testament, and it turns out uh, the ritual is still at the center of everything. That Jesus doesn't dump ritual off and say, yeah, don't worry about that. That's, That's all. We're in the world of the mind and thought and prayer now. No, he says, no, let me give you some, let me take those rituals and condense them down for you. I think it's pretty savvy because he also takes the rituals of Israel uh, and condenses them down so that they don't, they're not wedded to the temple anymore. They can go out. So you, can, you don't have to pilgrim, pilgrimage in to do the rituals of this, this new covenant, but you can actually take them out to the world, and everybody can do these rituals. But baptism, and uh, both baptism and the Lord's Supper, the two central rituals of the church, among some others, um, are from the Hebrew Bible, strategically changed for the new covenant. Uh, baptism, if, I'm sure you all know this, but uh, Jews were all getting baptized regularly in the days of Jesus. Uh, they, when they go to synagogue, on, at least on Sabbath, they would dip down in a mikvah or a mikvot uh, baptism. Uh, and so this is another interesting thing, which maybe we can talk about if you're interested. I don't have much to say. I'll just tell you what I think is interesting. Um, he, he takes what would be for most Jews a weekly ritual, a Sabbath ritual of baptizing before you go into the synagogue, and he turns it into a once-in-a-lifetime ritual like circumcision. 
And then he takes an annual ritual from Passover and he strategically changes it into a weekly ritual, right? So he's, he's playing with things. And he's, but but there, obviously the goal is not just for you to have bread and wine in your stomach. The goal is not just for you to have one really good bath for your whole life. Uh, the goal is that these actually change the way you see the world. Yes, please. Uh, as often as you gather, they gather on the first day of the week. They're Jews. They're gathering on Sabbath. Uh, it's implied. I, so I'd say it's not a weekly ritual, but it could be up to weekly or more. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah. Wow, it's funny. This guy named N.T. Wright, you guys know, uh, he's a, he used to be a bishop in Durham. He asked the exact same question when I, when I was telling him this. He's like, uh, I don't know if we can say weekly. I'm like, you're, okay, you're right. It, it, it could be up to weekly. It could be up to daily, right? You could have daily mass depending on how often they're gathering, what the, what the circumstance was. Um, okay. Maybe we should stop and think then about, um, well, maybe I'll just stop and ask questions here because before I go on, I have some other stuff, but I don't want to go on unless we, unless we feel like we're on the same page moving forward. So besides the weekly issue, yeah. People have different um, psychological need and respect for ritual. Some people can take it or leave it. Some people, it's the center of their identity in various places in between. Uh, what is there about us that uh, for some of us really need a lot of it and others of us, eh, it doesn't matter. That is a great question. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, why do some people f- seem to need a lot of ritual in their life, and a lot of structured ritual, and some people just don't seem to care about it that much? Um, is there something different about us, the way we're structured? Uh, I want to argue that that premise is, is wrong, although I think it's, it's well stated in the sense that it reflects the way people talk and think about it. But I just want to say everything we're doing is ritualed. I can't think of anything that we're doing from brushing our teeth, going to the bathroom. There's some habit or habit formation or ritual aspect to it. So when people tell me I'm not that into rituals, I'm like, well, let me follow you around for a day and we'll see if that's true, right? And, and so I, I'm going to guess that they actually are into rituals. They're just not thinking of them as such. So you just start asking questions. Why do you do the, you know, whatever the thing? So maybe you can give me an example of somebody who thinks they're not in, into rituals, but... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, okay, so he said, you know, some, some need communion every Sunday. Some people, like in the Church of Scotland I worked in, um, they would go quarterly and, or sometimes every six months do uh, communion because you had to be really sorry, uh, really repentant before you could come. There's a whole other worse version of it going on there as well. So here's what I would say to somebody, because I worked in a charismatic church uh, where I, be, I became a Christian there when I was 20. I became a pastor there when I was 24. And, uh, and they, were, they would say, we don't do liturgy, right? We don't, we don't follow a liturgy. We don't do any of this stuff. We're not into that kind of stuff because there's a lot of ex-Catholics. And so they were very afraid of having recited prayers or anything that looks Catholic, right? They're just reacting. And then I just pointed out to some of them at some point like, Yes, I understand you're saying you're not doing a liturgy, but man, I can almost set my watch by when that guy's going to get up and say a word of prophecy, right? Or, um, or I, you know, I can almost set my watch by when we're going to move from the kind of light background music of everybody flowing in the Holy Spirit into the announcement time, right? Uh, and so it turns out that if you just gather together and you do what's required of the church every week when they gather together, you just fall into unstated ritual ruts, Right? Um, and so this is, I'm so glad you asked this question because I think it's so important. So you are kind of listening to some voice and doing what they're telling you to do. But in that case, you're kind of, um, you're lazily letting it fall back. And so I don't want to say lazily because I do respect my brothers and sisters in the charismatic church. And, um, and I do have a sense that I actually do kind of like the idea that you come to encounter God and you leave some space open for things not to be exactly the way uh, they're set out to be. That's fine. Um, but you do have a ritual life. And so my challenge to them would be, 
If Jesus says, when you gather, do this, and, and you do it in order to be shaped as a kind of person in the world, that you're meant to see the world differently if you do this thing the way he says, than, than if you didn't, then I'm gonna err on the side of, well, let's just do it the way he says, right? Let's just try that one out for a while and see if it makes any difference. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's a great quote from, it was a tweet, actually, uh, from a New Testament scholar who said, um, I won't get it right, but it's something like this. He's talking about depression. He says, you know, when I, when I go through long bouts of depression, going to church on any given Sunday and taking communion doesn't really help. But going to church every Sunday during that period does. Right? So there's some sense that over the span, it does change me, transforms me. Or in the case of having depression, it holds me in there. Right? Doesn't, doesn't uh, let me slide off the deep end. So you, you, did you want to come back and say more on that? or No? Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. I'm not. I just, I'll just point out, that's not me, that's Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think the thinking... Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, is that I'm taking baptism, in this case, once-in-a-lifetime activity, and we're ta- I'm talking about it in the same way that I'm taking communion, which is once a week, and they seem to... I think the hidden presumption here is that they seem to be doing different things, but I'm talking about them as if they're in the same... Yeah, so you have to ask this question, what's the difference between doing something weekly or daily versus doing it annually? Uh, or, uh, you, I mean, it's interesting to me that Jesus gives no annual rituals. He follows, I mean, he's following the Jewish calendar, so he clearly has some that he's participating in. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up marriage. Like, I mean, think about creation. Oh, you guys got me on all my best spiels here. I'm sorry. Or my favorite, but probably not good for you. Think about creation, you get two central rituals, Sabbath and marriage. And what are the instructions for Sabbath and marriage in scripture? Let me tell you a slightly embarrassing story. Um, So I was a young minister, new in the job, and and I had my first, someone asked me to marry them, uh, to be the officiant, not to marry them, but uh, to officiate their wedding. And so, uh, and so I said, yes, I was, ex- I was nervous and excited. And so I began to prepare for the ceremony and I started looking through scripture for the instructions on how to do a wedding. And I looked and I looked and I looked and there is zero, uh, nothing whatsoever. The closest you get is, uh, that Jacob seems to get drunk and, uh, sleeps with Leah in a tent at night and finds out that it's the wrong woman in the morning. That's the closest you get to a de- even a description of a marriage. Right? So now think about that. Marriage seems to be considered a fundamental good in the creation account, like Sabbath, but it doesn't tell you at all how to do it. It's, it's purely improvised, right? So when people come to me now and they want to get married, they say, well, what do we have to do? I'm like, you, sometimes the guy will go, what's the least we have to do in this whole thing? Like, I want to keep this short and sweet. And I'm like, well, by law and by scripture, I just say, do you guys want to be married? And if you say yes, then we're done. We can walk away. Or maybe I can add a prayer on to you know, sanctify it. But uh, there's no instruction for something that seems so important in our lives, right? So central to the fabric of humanity, and there's no instruction whatsoever. So it means that when we think about, you know, I got married in the 1990s. My wedding was all improvisation, and it basically reflected Christian culture in the 1990s, Christian culture and American culture. So my wife's wedding dress, my tuxedo, what we ate, what we did, it was American culture. And in American culture back then, you could buy magazines this thick that all had wedding stuff in them, right? And they try to sell you like 29 cents of fabric as a veil for like $300 or something. It's a great racket. Um, yeah, so there's, there's all of these things we're doing, and I just point out where there's a, and this is where I think it's a very important point. When there's a vacuum of instruction, we will fill the vacuum. It's not like we just go like, oh, well, there's no instruction on Sabbath, so we're not going to do that. There's no instructions on weddings, so we're not going to do that. No, we fill it, and we fill it with something, and for most of us, we filled it with what our culture told us to. Somebody told us how to strategically sh- uh, twist this activity for some outcome, usually to sell us stuff. And I don't know how it is here or other places, but America, it's kind of like being in an airport. They can sell you the exact same thing and say it's for a wedding and charge you three times as much, right? Um, but it's not worth that. So we will, if, if there's no instructions, we will create instructions. But like everything else, we never create things out of nothing. 
We are always borrowing from what a culture is forming and shaping us to do. So you think about the weddings I've been involved in. Uh, all, it's all normal human activities. You can think of graduation ceremonies of, of the same thing. Like uh, you wear a fancy outfit, so you dress in this outfit that you're never going to wear. Well, hopefully you're not going to wear it again, uh, maybe just once. Uh, when you, even when you walk, you walk funny, right? You like row a boat down the aisle. When you talk, you swear oaths. Like who on a daily basis, basis says, for the rest of my life, I swear that I'm going to be the best human ever to this other person. I mean, nobody keeps those oaths, right? I mean, you're always breaking these oaths or bending them in some way. You you're always find some way to be uncharitable to your spouse or to not love them in the way that you should be. But you stand up in front of people who actually know you and you swear things that you know you can't actually do. It's, it's a state. And so what are we doing? We're trying to like, well, we can think of all kinds of things of why we're doing this. But I'll tell you that why did I stand up in 1998 and say, I'm going to be the superhuman who's going to love her unquestionably and the best, I'm going to be the best person who's ever loved her before? Because that's what my culture told me I was supposed to do. Sounded good. I went with it. And I was clueless. Yes, sir. Well, that was an easy question. He, he asked me what was the, uh, the future state of the Haredi and uh, the Haredim and the Eschaton. Oh, uh, well, that is the first time I've ever been asked that question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the irony is I, I live near the lar- largest population of religious Jews in the world, Brooklyn, right? There's more of them in Brooklyn than there are here, believe it or not. And uh, my, so my students are constantly, because they're seeing them on the train, on the subway, and so they're, they're like, what's the deal? And like, okay, they're Jewish, but why aren't they wearing cloths? Why are they wearing a black suit, of all things? I said, well, there's a story about that, right? And what's the story? Why a black suit? Because European, Eastern European culture in the 19th century informed their way of thinking about holiness, piety, uprightness, and that got wedded into the way they dressed and then taught to their children, and this is the way it is. And if you don't wear this particular hat in this particular way... I love Israel because you get to see all the, like, hipster Jews that wear their hat cocked back like this, or the small kippahs. I had to ask, what's the difference between the small ones and the big ones, and what's the culture of the kippah? And, um, but it's all coming from somewhere. So they might like to tell you, I don't know what they would say if you say, why are you wearing these, this black suit? At the end of the day, it's because Eastern European culture of that time dictated it to them and they bought it and then it got wedded in, which I think is part of the danger of not thinking about where rituals come from, right? Is because then you just uncritically drink in whatever people are telling you to do. And the next thing you know, you find yourself checking this 20 times a day praying, you know, to the gods of the applications and iPhones, and you not even, and then once, this is what happens in my class, I say, you know, you don't actually need a cell phone. Like, I was raised without one. Now, like, I didn't have one until eight years ago for the first time in my life, and they look at me like I'm from another planet, because they literally cannot imagine, and they'll say things, it's not funny, but it is funny to me. They'll say things like, but what if I go to the emergency room? I say, well, they got phones in the emergency room, like, and their question is, Who's going to tell my parents, right? It's like, well, do your parents actually, I mean, I, I tell my kids, if you go to the emergency room, call me once they know what's going on with you. I don't want to hear the drama on the way. I don't want like, why do you want to make me anxious before I need to be, right? But they've uncritically drunk in their culture. Their parents have been co-opted by this. Uh, and so they're doing all, you know, it's who can get whom to do what with their bodies. The ritual wars have been fought. We lost. The cell phone manufacturers won. It's over. So now it's a now what do we do? Uh, for young people. It's, it's completely over. So now their bosses, when they get a job, all of their bosses expect them to be available 24 hours a day by text. And they can't imagine any other world. It's really depressing uh, how this drives their entire psyche. I want to make sure also, I'm, I don't want to just pick on cell phone because I have one. I think there's a proper use, right? Abuse doesn't mitigate proper use. And uh, you just have to be very careful. I keep it as an object separate from me. I want to make sure that we understand that, you know, uh, like the gentleman asked the question of, well, what are people who don't care about ritual or they're not interested in it? You're in it. Like, you don't get to choose whether you step out. I think the analogy I use is, I think when it comes to things like sacraments and rituals or even theology or philosophies of, of life, it's almost as if we're, you know, in a pool and everybody, you know, some people are doing the doggy paddle, some people are doing a breaststroke, some people are doing a backstroke. And, and it's almost as if we think we can just hop out of the pool and kind of look for a while and see which, see which stroke is the best, right? 
Uh, and I said, no, 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 you're in the pool. You're in the pool and you're swimming. And that's how you get to look at other, other strokes. Uh, nobody gets the advantage of hopping out. And so we're in this thick mess of rituals for good or for ill. The, you know, we can talk about, I, I give the example in the book of, I started smoking when I was 12 years old. And you think, why would a 12-year-old boy start smoking cigarettes? Um, well, because there was a whole advertising campaign in, in the Americas in the, in the 1980s aimed at getting children to smoke cigarettes. And it was very carefully done because you don't want to, you don't want to be the company that is selling cigarettes to children. But you know, they changed their logos into cartoons that were friendly to children. There's a whole culture. I don't know if you have this culture in, in Israel, but there's a whole culture of cool that you look cool if you're, because what looks more cool than a 12 year old boy smoking cigarettes, right? That's just the coolest thing. But I thought in my mind, I thought I looked cool smoking cigarettes. That's why I did it. I mean, there's no other, everybody who smokes their first cigarette, you realize your body rejects the, the cigarette, right? But you push through uh, until you do it. And it ended up being a two pack a day smoker for the next uh, 10 years, uh, fully addicted. And just notice what they needed to do in order to profit off of me. They needed, they needed to habituate me into this weird practice of smoking a cigarette, something my body did not want to do. And so they had to construct a whole system that had the movies involved. And I, this sounds all conspiratorial. I, don't, I think we can kind of slip into these modes just because the world is broken as well. I don't think it has to be a big conspiracy. But the movies sold me cigarettes. Uh, my friends sold me cigarettes. Uh, cigarette manufacturers sold me on the idea that I should be doing this. I should be doing it often. Uh, and because it had certain chemicals in it. And, uh, and also, I, I have to point out to people as a young person, I liked blowing out clouds of smoke. I liked that activity. And that was part of the reason that I smoked as well. So uh, all, of the, all they were doing is taking me as a ritual person, the way God created me to inhabit practices and some of them twisted in order to this new end. This is how God created us. It's how he created Israel. That's why he gives them rituals. That's why Jesus kept the ritual program going. And they took that part of me that's a, a ritual person in the world and they turned it into a new tradition that was sexy and desirable and, and was gonna give me the world, you know, people are gonna like you because you do this thing. Now you can think of makeup manufacturing does this as well, clothing manufacturing in America cars, like what kind of, your car is almost your person, like what people think about you is what kind of car you have. It's very weird. Um, but everybody's doing this. It's who can get whom to do what with their bodies. And if you can get a whole community to do something with your bodies, you've won. Like that's the best. Because getting individuals to do it, that's a lot of work. But if I can get your whole community to buy in on something, uh, then, I, then I have uh, whatever I want out of you, I can get it. So think about this. If we're not thinking about it, if we're not going through our lives thinking, okay, why do I do this thing that I do? And I would include going to college. That's another series of rituals that people are going through. Um, why do I do this? Who's, who's trying to sell this idea to me? Who's painting this picture for me? Uh, and should I be listening to them? Like, do they even know? Uh, one of the uh, things I run into, I do a lot of counseling with our students because they're on their own for the first time living in New York City, which is a, you know, it's a fun place to live. And they'll have like a breakup with a, you know, a girlfriend or boyfriend and they'll come in and tell me, well, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I just went and played video games for three days straight. And I'm like, why, why would, like, how does that solve your, your being depressed? I said, well, my roommate said I should do it. I'm like, why are you listening to 18 year olds about, have they ever been depressed? Do they know what it looks like five years from now? Do they like, do they have any experience with this? Um, when people's parents die, you know, their roommates tell them all kinds of silly things they should be doing. Like, you just need to learn to forget them. You know, it's been a year. You just need to get over it. It's, everybody has these prepackaged ideas they've been handed, and we need to investigate and think about why we do these things. Some of them are worth holding on to and strengthening and doubling down and say, we should really do these. And some of them are probably let, uh, worth letting go. But we're going to do them no matter what. And they're going to direct us either for good or for ill to understand God, ourselves, and creation better. It's going it's to go one way or the other. There's no, no Switzerland when it comes to rituals. Everybody's in the game and everybody's directing. And I would just point us that if I, I'm a big fan of the book of Leviticus. I know it's everybody's favorite book in the Bible. Uh, thank you. Uh, but one of the things that's remarkable about Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers is by the time you get to the end of Deuteronomy, you can just ask a question like, do you think there's any aspect of God, or of life that God just doesn't care about? Like, just do whatever you want. It's all fine, right? 
Um, do you think any area of your sexuality, any area of your how, how you build your house, how you treat your animals, how you treat foreigners, how you treat native born, uh, how you treat God? No, it's all in there, right? And so if he cares that much, then it seems to me that like we should at least care a little bit about this rather than just going, ah, that's what we do, right? Now, I think at the end of that investigation, we might say, well, it's what we do, and it actually works, it's fine. It's a good improvisation, right? Uh, Sabbath, it doesn't tell us what to do. This is what my tradition does. It's a, it's a faithful improvisation, right? Uh, communion. I always say, like, I ask people, how do you do communion? And you hear bread. Well, what kind of bread? Uh, white bread or wheat bread? Can it have leaven in it? Can it not have leaven in it? Uh, can it be wine? Does it, can it be grape juice? Uh, can it be water? Can it be uh, Mountain Dew and Dorito chips? Like, like, so everybody is flexible on, on communion, but you, at some point we'll cross a line where you're like, ah, I don't think so, right? And so we have to think about what is faithful improvisation, because it doesn't say in, in the biblical text what you're supposed to do for communion. It says that you're supposed to eat bread, you're supposed to drink wine. It doesn't say the boundary, white wine, red wine, what, right? Now you could do archaeology and try to figure out exactly what Jesus did and then do that exact thing, but it, it doesn't seem that, that he's concerned about that. Yes, David. So, so he asked about symbolism. What, what's the role of symbolism? Because obviously symbolism plays a key role. It's a great question. I think you're planting this question for us. Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, So in the early church at the Desert Fathers, there became this issue of we don't have water to baptize people with. And there was a letter sent out, well, what do we do? We don't have any water, we don't have any extra water. And they said, use sand. Just pour sand over them, right? Uh, so that would be an improvisation that is an extreme situation. It's not the way you want it to be, but it's a way that it works in that situation. You know, if somebody, what prevents me from being baptized? No water. Okay, well, use sand. But uh, here's why I don't think symbol, so if you know the history of the Christian church, Christians have fought over the idea of what the symbols mean, right? It split the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, you know, the Protestants split on this several various ways uh, from the Catholics, transubstantiation, consubstantiation. And I just want to say, when you look across scripture, symbols don't seem to be the center of what's going on with rituals. Symbols have some meaning uh, built in there, but here's the problem is we try to hold the bread and the wine in our hand. I'm just using communion as an easy example here. And we, try, we look at it and we think like, okay, what is this? What's going on here? What does this mean by looking at the things in our hands? Um, and I think that might detract us from what's going on in the ritual. And here's why. Uh, anybody seen Karate Kid? The movie Karate? Okay. I'll give you a, a very short synopsis of one scene. There's a guy, Mr. Miyagi, who knows karate very well. He's from Okinawa, Pat Morita. Uh, and he, there's a kid, Daniel's son, who lives in his apartment complex. He sees that Mr. Miyagi is a karate expert. He's getting beat up at school. He goes to Mr. Miyagi and says, will you teach me karate? Karate kid, right? So Mr. Miyagi says, come over to my house. He has this other house. He said, come over here and I'll teach you karate. And so he comes over one, one morning. Mr. Miyagi comes out with a bucket and a rag. And he says, yeah, you know it. He says, wash all, he has like a dozen cars. Wash all of these cars. Right hand circle, left hand circle. And then you're gonna, and once you're done washing them, you're gonna wax them. Wax on, wax off. Have you, anybody heard this wax? I can't do this with my left hand. Wax on, wax off. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he's like, no, 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 don't ask me questions. Just do it, right? So he does it, comes back the, <clears throat> the next day, he's exhausted, you know. He's like, all right, we're gonna paint the fence. Up, down, breathe in through nose, out through mouth, right? And he goes through four different chores, onerous chores. Like he's got him slave labor, right? He's sanding the deck, he's washing, painting the house side to side, up and down, breathe in through nose, out through mouth. And then finally, the fourth or fifth day, Danielson snaps and he's like, I'm not doing this. You're just, you're just getting free labor out of me. This is a big trick, right? And then he's like, no, 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 Danielson, come here. And he says, show me, you know, paint the fence. And, you know, and he does it. Uh, and, and sorry, he says, show me paint the fence. And then Mr. Miyagi starts punching him. And then he realizes all of a sudden that the movements that he's been burning into his body are actually karate moves. 
Uh, and then Mr. Miyagi throws a bunch of punches and kicks, and he's able to defend them all. Now, it's Hollywood, so it's a little fantastical. But here's the trick. He thought he could decode the mystery of learning karate by seeing this all as some kind of symbols of kicks and punches. And uh, there's a Jewish um, philosopher named Martin Buber who says, uh, all journeys have a secret destination of which the traveler is unaware. Right? So Danielson was not aware that he was actually learning karate when he was sanding decks and waxing cars. I do that. I'm a college professor. Everything I do is ritual. I ask them to ritually read things strategically, <clears throat> to write in this really funny academic way that's not so funny to them. Um, I ask them to sit and listen, to interact, ask questions. I ask them to do all kinds of weird things. And often my students will go, why are we doing this? This doesn't seem to do anything. I know why we're doing this. I know there's 17 reasons we're doing this one exercise. Um, but I understand that you can't tell. You're 18. You, don't, you haven't been around. <clears throat> you haven't been teaching for 15 years. Why would you know? Like, why would you presume that you could walk into a classroom and just see through all of this and understand it all just by looking at it? It's kind of naive when you think about it. I thought that when I was in college, too. I, uh, we all complained about science, uh, assignments that we couldn't figure out. So I think if you get stuck on the symbolism that this is all just symbolic actions that's encoded and you just need the decoder ring... Uh, then you miss the very point of doing the ritual. Now, I think once you learn the ritual, like once Danielson knows karate and understands it, he can look back and go, ah, I now see how side to side painting, I see how that built this particular move into him. But to think that you can understand in advance just by thinking it through and symbolically decoding it, uh, I think here would be the, the, the problem. We, we bring the same interpretation of parables, that the way we interpret parables. So Jesus says, the man who wanted to build a tower and didn't consider the cost, right? It's a little parable. It's a fictional story, he told him. There's no man. It's not a real tower. It's not, right? It's just a little fictional story. But what he's trying to get you to do is say, okay, there's man in the story, and then there's a man in real life. There's something like a tower that's expensive and costly and hard to do in the story, and there's something in real life that's expensive, costly, and hard to do. And all you're trying to do is decode it. So, okay, the man, that's me. The tower that's uh, expensive and costly, that's the life of following Christ. And you need to consider whether you want to do that ahead of time, right? That's how you interpret a parable. I think people take that key of interpretation and they try to work it out in rituals. And they say, this happens all the time in Leviticus with um, scholars. They go, okay, the blood means life and laying on your hand is passing the sins. And they try to just symbolically encode it. And I'm just not convinced that that's what's going on there. That if it's more like wax on, wax off, then you, you learn what God is trying to show you by doing the thing he's telling you to do. Let me give you one simple example and then we can uh, probably need to wrap it up here. Uh, who here learned uh, your times table when you're in a primary school, right? A multiplication times table, right? Can I hear a real question? How did you learn them? Repetition, right? Did anybody learn them by song? You, you memorize a song? My kids did it by song. Uh, we had mimeograph sheets where they just gave you one every day and you got two minutes and you just go through, right? And after weeks and weeks of doing that, now, when I was in second grade, I could not have told, if you asked me, Drew, why are you doing this every day for week after week after week? I would have just said, because we need to learn times. I wouldn't have known why, right? I wouldn't have known that in eighth grade, or S2, um, that I actually needed to know these things by rote in order to do algebra because if I'm getting hung up on the basic arithmetic, then I can't even think about the algebra problem that I need to be doing, right? That it's actually opening a, a future door for me that I couldn't have ever anticipated, right? I'm doing all, when I teach Hebrew Bible in the first couple of weeks, I'm doing all kinds of things that I know we're gonna need in the last couple of weeks. But nobody there knows that. I've taught the class, I know what I'm doing, and so it, it works out. So when we talk about ritual, we're talking about brushing teeth. We are talking about learning times tables. We are talking about the Lord's Supper. We're strategically twisting some activity. We're telling people, you should do this. And they trust us. They do it. And we're hoping they're going to see something differently through doing it. And if that's true, then, the goal, then good theology is embodying the life of Christ in order to see the kingdom of God the way he's trying to show it to us. And good theology is not sitting back and thinking about the facts of transubstantiation or consubstantiation and working it all out in our heads and then thinking we understand what's going on. That has its place. I'm glad people are working on those issues, but that's not what good theology looks like, which means we're all theologians. 
Okay, I think I need to wrap it up because it's a little warm in here and you guys have been very, very patient with me. So I appreciate that. Uh, any questions we need to talk? I, got, I only got to point one and two out of six points. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a good example. So she talked about how religious women are grabbing women who aren't religious or don't look religious and trying to get them into little rituals like the Shabbat candle. And again, they're tugging on that good old-fashioned Jewish guilt, like, yeah, I should probably be doing this, but I don't like it or I, I wasn't raised this way. Yeah, that's a, that's a uh, great insight. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I think when I ran into that in 1 Corinthians where Paul, and again, it's not a prescription, but he just says, as we are one body, so is the one loaf of the Lord's Supper. And there's, so there is some idea that the, there's some symbolic value to the one loaf. So I don't want to throw symbolism out the windows and say it's not important. I just want to make sure that we put it in the right context. So this is great. If I've done my job correctly, by the way, we just sat through a whole ritual here. Everybody notice, and you all knew how to do it, right? So you're all masters in the ritual. You knew how to come in here. None of you took your chairs and turned them around in a circle or faced the other way or stood looking me in the eye while I was, you knew how to far away to sit. You knew that you needed to sit and listen. There was all kinds of unspoken rules that you followed to participate in this ritual. And it's, um, we're, it's, it's meant to be a conversation, but we're strategically twisting it into this weird conversation where I'm doing most of the talking. And look at the goal is to try and get you to see the world slightly different, see yourself and the world different than when you walked in the door. Hopefully, maybe on a good day that might have happened. Um, but if this and math and brushing teeth and communion are all uh, rituals, then um, we, can, we can take an inv inventory and just critique and revisit. And, uh, and I would say, um, on be I mean, I'm in the Church of England here. Uh, I, I feel... Well, the Anglican Church, yeah, sorry. I feel compelled to also say, we don't need to make this stuff up from scratch. Believe it or not, Christians have been working at these issues for 2,000 years almost. Uh, and so there's probably reasons they have continued. Sometimes it's not good reasons, right? Sometimes there's a perverse incentives for carrying on certain rituals. Um, but there are also a lot of really good ones out there. Um, so Shabbat is the one that... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I need to make it up. I fall into other people's patterns that are safe. Um, I, I also, I'll end on this. I'll, I'll try to scare the hell out of you, and I mean that lit quite literally. <clears throat> God, through the prophet Amos, tells the people of Israel in the north, you keep bringing your animal sacrifice. So if we had a, a TV camera on them, they would be bringing animal sacrifices up to the temple according to the law of, of Moses. And here's God's reaction to that. He says, I hate I despise your sacrifices. Uh, so there's this whole other area, I think is a legitimate question for the church to ask and individuals to ask, am I worshiping God in such a way that he looks at it and it's a stench, a foul stench to him that he hates and despises? So I do wanna make this tug and say, we are improvising, but there are safe ways to improvise where we can follow on from what's been taught, you know, what's, what's obvious and true and what the church has done. And there are, there's probably some boundary where we cross over into flippant or irreverent or uh, in some ways dangerous rituals. And I'll, I'll tell you, if, if you don't know, the reason why he hates their sacrifice is because they treat the poor and the vulnerable horribly. And then they try to bring an animal to the, to the altar and he says, no, 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 no. You've been preparing that animal by your treatment of your neighbor, the foreigner, the widow, uh, the, the elder. And you did not prepare that. So you, you thought you could just bring the best one from your flock. Mm -mm. So think about the church service now. As we gather to worship God, if we're not talking about, concerned about business, home, relationships, policies, the decisions that our governments are making towards those who are vulnerable in our community, that seems like we might be in stenchy land, right? It might be dangerous. Okay, I want to end there because I don't want to hold you a minute longer than I absolutely have to. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, as I say in my church, muito obrigado para tudo. Thank you for everything. You have been listening to OnScript. 
delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just two or five dollars per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.